Faith Ringgold um, is a world-renowned artist. She, um, well, I'll, I'll just read you this, the, the intro first. Faith Ringgold, now 91, is an American painter, writer, mixed media sculptor, and performance artist, best known for her beautifully painted um, and mixed media narrative quilts. Um, the New Museum Show is the first museum retrospective in New York devoted to this inventive, tenacious, and influential artist and activist. Um, you know, basically, you know, to start with, this lady, she is, she's received over, over 80 uh, grants and fellowships and all that. Uh, Guggenheim in 1987, NEA for sculpture in 78 and 88 for uh, an NEA award for um, um, uh, painting in 1989, the Caldecott uh, Children's Book Award for Tar Beach in 1992, uh, um, the New York Foundation for the Arts, grant in, in 88, um, you know, there's over 80 awards that she's, that she's won that are very prestigious and, and all that. Um, she's a remarkable painter. And wh what we have on this, on this first page is Tar Beach, which is something which is a very well-known piece of hers. Um, it, it actually is the, um, the the book that she that she uh, produced was from this piece, um, and in the center, this is a self portrait of uh, in the um, on the left. Uh, that was from I think the the late 70s. I'm not, not 100% certain about that. It might have been the 60s, actually. It might have been 67. Um, anyway, we're going to move on. And this is a shot of the installation wall, one of the installation walls in, in the show. And this is showing the, most of these are from the French collection that she did from uh, images from her trip to France and her recollection of that experience. Um, okay. Faith Ringgold was born in Harlem, the youngest of three children in 1930. Um, her parents, Andrew Lewis Jones and Willie Posey Jones were descendants of working class families displaced by the migration. Um, I understand that her grandparents were both teachers also. So education was very valued in their, in their family. Um, Ringgold's mother was a fashion designer. Her father, as, as well as working a range of jobs, was an avid storyteller. They raised her in an environment that encouraged her creativity. After the Harlem Renaissance, Ringgold's childhood home in Harlem became surrounded by a thriving art scene where figures such as Duke Ellington and Langston Hughes lived around the corner. Her childhood friend, Sonny Rollins, who actually became, was a lifelong friend, but uh, uh, would grow up to become a prominent jazz musician, often visited her family and practiced saxophone at their parties. Because of her chronic asthma, Ringgold, Ringgold explored visual arts as a major pastime through the support of her mother, often experimenting with crayons as a young girl. Uh, she also learned how to sew and work creatively with fabric from her mother. Ringgold maintains that despite her upbringing in the Great Depression era Harlem, this did not mean she was a poor, she was poor and oppressed. She was protected from oppression and surrounded by a loving family. 
with all these influences combined, Ringgold's future artwork was greatly affected by the people, poetry, and music she experienced in her childhood, as well as the racism, sexism, and segregation she dealt with in her everyday life. So uh, these are images of her on the top and the, the pastel all the way over on the right um, is the oldest piece that I could dig up actually online. This was, this was actually a couple of years after she graduated from uh, with her masters. So she was a fairly mature artist at that point. Um, I'll go, I'll go further into, into her, you know, what, what she was up to, but, um, but it's interesting to see this piece in relationship to her work. And in 1955, Ringel received her uh, bachelor's degree from uh, City College and soon thereafter um, taught in New York City public school system. In 1959, she received her master's from City College and um, left with her mother and daughters on a, uh, her first trip to Europe. Uh, while traveling abroad in Paris, Florence, and Rome, Ringel visited many museums, including the Louvre. And this museum uh, in particular inspired her uh, future series of books. And I'm, I'm showing you these kind of out of out of uh, uh, order in the in the unfolding of her career, but I wanted you to see examples of these quilts, um, and you know, uh, dancing in the Louvre um, even in 1991 that was kind of a um, uh, you know out of the ordinary thing for people to be doing, shall we say. Um, but really interesting pieces and, and this piece with this little Vincent Van Gogh uh, character over in, over in the corner with the sunflowers uh, on the right, there's a whole group of women's rights activists, civil rights activists, of abolitionists sitting at the table doing this sunflower quilt. Okay. So at City College, she studied with these two artists who were both social realists. So that had a very, I think a very profound influence on her. Um, her values were kind of, kind of confirmed by, by, these, by these artists and they're ter pretty terrific people. Um, okay. So we're gonna move ahead into her first series. In, in fact, she took some of her work, some of her earlier work, like that, like that pastel, to, to an art dealer and you know, looked at the, what the art dealer was showing in the gallery before she went in and she showed her work to this art dealer and the art dealer looked at it and said, no, uh, I, can't, I can't use this and you need to, you need to find what you're what you're about. So she took that information in and went back and 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 began to work on this series that really had to do with race relations and 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 take that on at that point. Um, and you can really see in these pieces. Let me see. Let me move along here. Um, yeah. Okay. So. This series is, is really, um, uh, it's really a long line of work that engage racial issues in her work. You know, these, these kind of pasty faced uh, uh, people staring out at us like ghosts, you know, they, these are, <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't look very inviting to me. So, you know, and, and in this other piece, the, the, the uh, demarcation between the black and white figures in, in that, um, 
really kind of, you know, I, I think it says a lot. It says, it says, you know, there is a divide here. And here's a whole, a whole group of pieces from that series. Um, you know, this Mr. Charlie piece is really, you know, there's a, there's a wry sense of humor throughout all this work. And, 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 you know, there's a seriousness to the work. And at the same time, a, a, a an almost cartoon-like quality to some of it. Um, and, and that, that play between the seriousness of the issues that she's dealing with and the sense of humor and playfulness is something which she, which she weaves through. Let's see. Okay. In, in 1967, she was given an opportunity, uh, an art dealer, um, you know, they often art dealers close their galleries during the summertime because it's a downtime. A gallerist on 57th Street invited her to come and paint in his gallery while it was closed during the summer. And, and so this was in 1967. There was a lot going on. There, was, there were demonstrations. There were riots in the streets. There was all kinds of stuff going on. He said to her, come in, use the, use the gallery to paint in, do large scale pieces and do whatever you want. And that's what she did. And this is one of the pieces from that, from that, that series. You know, when you look at it at first, it's a postage stamp commemorating the advent of black power. Well, uh, the, the post office wasn't going to pick up on this one, but, um, if you look at it, when, when we look at it right side up, you see the sort of the black power thing across there. And there's actually an X through it. So Malcolm X. Um, um, if you look at on the right, this is, this is the same piece turned on its side. So you can actually see the black power going up there. And it's really hard to see, but if you look really carefully, the, the white spaces between the images spells out white power. Okay. You get where we're going. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the black light series was actually part of what she painted in that period of time. And this is where she's starting to um, move into the masks and, and it kind of harken back to um, kind of African um, roots and, and pull up the mask-like shapes. These are all really large scale pieces. This, this piece is 72 by 144. Now, she had a, um, she had a show at the end of this, this period of time. These were all really political. I mean, when you look at this piece, it's, it's, um, it's really, you know, it, it's poignant. It is, it is, you know, what's behind it is really um, very dramatic. And, and this, this stuff she was seeing all the time, she said, you know, up in, up in Harlem, there were riots that were happening and, and there was no reporting about, about these, about these things that I was seeing out on the street. Um, but at the same time, this, there's this kind of wacky, um, um, boy, buoyant quality to this, to this piece. It's, it's showing something, you know, there's blood, there's, there's all the, this drama going on, you know, knives and guns and all that stuff, but it's very cartoon-like at the same time. Um, so she's playing those things off of each other. You know, I mean, this is the time of, of pop 
pop art and all that. So integrating cartoon-like images into, into something uh, was not uncommon, though pop stayed very much away from political issues. And that's one of the things that was, that was very um, problematic for her career at that time as far as sales are concerned. But it really made um, her work stand out in a way. Um, so she did have a show of, of the pieces that she did during this summer and didn't sell anything from that show, but got great critical acclaim. And in fact, this piece, American People Series number 20, Die, is, is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art now. Uh, it is in the show. They they lent it for the show, but uh, but you know it's it's really interesting stuff. Um, here we have Wernicke, which was actually part of the inspiration for her. She saw this very powerful political piece when she was in you know, basically, I believe it was at the Museum of Modern Art at that point, because uh, they, they uh, uh, it wasn't going back to France until Franco died. Uh, that was a requirement that Picasso had. So when you look at this piece by Faith Ringgold and you look at Gornica, you can see the kind of, you know, a, a kind of relationship between the the activity in, in the piece. Um, okay, and now we're gonna move on to, to um, the flag series. And, you know, there's this black man, they're arm in arm with, with you know, this blonde, blonde white woman and, 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 and blonde white man. He's holding a knife, he's bleeding, did he just stab himself? Did he just get shot? What's going on here? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I also know that this is a big piece. It's a 72 by 96. And this was included in that show also. Um, I contrast it with Jasper Johns, where you have this cool, emblematic icon of an American flag that is very neutral. You know, Jasper Johns approached this thing, you bring to it what you bring to it. Um, uh, and contrast that with the heat of, of uh, Faith Ringgold. She definitely brings something different to it than, than uh, the Jasper Johns brought to, brought to his flag. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this series, one of the reasons I brought up this other quilt out of, out of order, it's from 1997. It, this series has continued throughout her career and she's come back to it. And, you know, the pain of, of, um, of the Black experience in this country is really something which she continues to focus in on. Um, and on, on, the, on the right is this piece from 66, which is children, hide little children. You know, it's kind of like the, the um, um, part of the series that she did about the Underground Railroad. And on the, on the far right-hand side in this fur coat with the, with the uh, scarf on is Faith Ringgold, who organized this protest out in front of the Whitney. She actually held protests out in front of the Metropolitan Museum and uh, the Museum of Modern Art at different times. Um, just focusing on the fact that there were there there were very few women artists and extraordinarily few black women artists that were included in the museum um, 
rouster at this stage of the game. Um, and on the, on the left is the Gorilla Girls. This was from uh, 2011, actually. And things have not changed that much. Uh, less than 4% of the artists in the, the modern art section are women, but 76% of the nudes uh, are female. <laughs> so the Gorilla Girls are really a gas and, and, and make a very powerful point. Um, so Faith Rengel was never one to back off from, from the issues that, as she saw them. And um, she really, you know, went, went straight for it with this. Um, inequity, wherever she saw it, she was gonna, she was gonna engage it. Um, okay. And now, you know, in the, in the early 70s, she did a whole series of posters for the uh, Black Panthers, and for um, you know the the one on the on the left is for uh, Angela Davis. Um, so uh, basically, she was she was standing up for 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 these these issues in her career. Now that was not in 1971 in the art world. Um, there was a certain kind of you know minimalism and and uh, pop art and all that very apolitical. It was not involved with 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 these issues and and the you know the the critics of the time were not didn't look at this. They looked at this as propaganda art. You know basically that uh, okay and this poster was actually one of the widest distributed posters in, in the early 70s. Um, what's on there is the United States of Attica was a widely distributed uh, uh, Ringel political poster from the 70s. This poster was dedicated to the men who died in 1971 at Attica prison for demonstrating against deplorable conditions. This red, black, and green poster depicts the map of America, the dates and other details of infamous acts of violence that occurred are posted within each state, such as race riots, witch hunts, presidential assassinations, lynchings, Indian wars. Around the periphery of the map are the statistical history of the, the dead, wounded, missing in American wars starting from 1776 um, and ending in Vietnam. Um, and she, basically there's an appeal for people to add their own onto it. Um, now, I put this up next to a Jasper Johns map, okay, of the USA, very different planet, you know, it's really, Jasper Johns, it's about painting. It's about, it's about using this as a, as a matrix to put paint on a surface where, where, you know, faith is really putting it out there. Um, again, the African-American flag, the colors that, that are being used in, in a number of these posters Okay. And now we move on to, she, she began to do the, the quilts. Um, after, after her experience in 1967 of having to schlep all those gigantic canvases and find a damn place to store them, uh, she started to work on, on um, these, these quilted pieces. And, and use this as, as a way, basically they're acrylic um, painted and then, and then you know, fabric pieces around the edges. Um, she saw Tibetan Tongas and she also saw you know, African um, kinte cloth and, and these different patterns in, from, from the African culture that she wanted to try and integrate into the 
these pieces. Um, so a lot easier to roll up a quilt than it is to schlep around it, uh, a, a 15 foot painting. Okay, and um, okay, let's see. Faith married Burdette Ringgold in uh, May 19, 1962, visited West Africa twice, once in 76 and once in 77. Uh, these, travels inf these travels influenced her works with masks and, and with her soft sculpture. So we'll go on to that. Let's see. Oop, skip that. All right, there we go. Uh, the Dan masks were from um, uh, Liberia, and, and those were kind of the inspiration for the, the, um, the look of these, of these pieces. Um, and there, there were a number of people that were experimenting with soft sculpture at that point, you know, Klaus Oldenburg and, um, uh, well, a number of different people were doing, were doing this, but, um, you know, she, she picked up on that and, and it, it really brought, brought back up the, the things that she had learned from her mother in, in you know, working with fabric. Okay. And so here we are again, um, 1976. Um, uh, it, it, it's really the, the, you know, the time of, of, of great self-congratulatory celebration in America. And what does she do? Wake and resurrection of the Bicentennial Negro. So uh, it's, you know, it's a really interesting contrast. Her, her the, the sense of humor and the play in, in these pieces and the seriousness of what the issues were uh, come together and contrast each other. Um, okay. And Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima was actually her first um, story quilt. Um, and she did this, actually, she collaborated with her mother to create this quilt. Um, and I've seen some pictures of them working together on it, which is, which is really fabulous. Um, and on the, on the right, we have uh, Beth Starr, um, Liberation of Aunt Jemima. If any of you've been sticking with me over, over the talks, I did, I did do a talk on, on Beth Starr. And the, you know, this piece is, is is really, you know, it's very powerful in its own way. It's really sardonic and just puts it in your face. Um, and, you know, who's afraid of Aunt Jemima? Well, here we have a situation where, where um, Faith Ringgold tried to get a book published and they, she couldn't find a publisher. They didn't want to publish it. They didn't think it was, it would sell. They, you know, didn't know if there was a market for it. So what does she do? She writes her quilt. So she published her, she self-published on this quilt and continued to do that throughout the eighties um, and still does. Um, so Okay, and another another kind of outsider painted a portrait of Faith Ringgold. Alice Neal painted this wonderful portrait. I mean, this for Alice Neal is one of the most flattering portraits I've ever seen her do. So it says something about her respect for Faith Ringgold. Um, and I, I put a couple of uh, blow-ups from the Aunt Jemima uh, 
so you could actually read a little bit of what was in there. Um, and you can actually be able to see it. If you come back um, when we when we record this and post it, you can stop the 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 uh, video and actually read something out of it if, if if you're interested. But there is so much information out there on Faith Ringgold. She's she's done. She's not shy about doing interviews. So she, there's a bunch of them out there, and I'll talk more about that later. Okay, echoes of Harlem. And here's another, you know, Lover's Trilogy is um, uh, another series that she worked on, um, Mother's Quilt. And now, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about also is her, really her lifelong commitment to, to teaching. Um, she taught in, in, um, in the public school system in the Bronx and, and also worked with Benny Andrews, who is another really terrific black artist, very funny, his sense of humor is really terrific. And, and um, they, they did work together at times uh, on, some, on some projects working with kids and all that. Um, she's, she has um, started a foundation that actually goes into at-risk schools and works with kids, um, encouraging their creativity. And she stands as a as a inspiration to to you know many. Um, let me let me say you know she went on you know after teaching in in the public school system to teach in at the college level um, and did many residencies. Um, I believe she was at San Diego. Um, uh, Yeah, at Cal, Cal uh, San Diego. So she was uh, she was teaching in California for a period of time. I'm not sure what that was. I didn't I didn't look up her her the roster of of schools that she's taught at. But um, but Benny Andrews is a really funny guy too. I mean, he's definitely you know in there. And there's there's a kind of sly social commentary that goes along with his work too. Um, the stark image of sorrow that symbolizes a cultural memory of oppression. Uh, okay, yeah. okay, here we are. Um, Tar Beach. Um, you know, this is this is one of her most well-known pieces, um, and and it is the the inspiration for the the book that that she published. Um, they did get around to publishing her and they didn't regret it. Um, the, the book that came out of this, this image is, is a Caldecott award-winning book and it won the, uh, just, it won a bunch of awards. Let's put it that way. I don't need to, I don't need to elaborate on that, but, but it's a wonderful piece. And, you know, notice this, this little girl dreaming of flying in the sky flying over the bridge, the freedom, sense of creativity. Beautiful piece, just, you know. And again, this is Tar Beach 2. The goody goody ice cream factory. Well, <laughs> All right, and, and now we're getting back to um, the, the French collection that was a series that she did. And again, you know, just pointing out, not a lot of black 
figures in the museum system. And so what she do? She replaces uh, Matisse's lily white model with uh, a black model. Um, you know, and then, and then over here we've got uh, Joe Baker's bananas uh, who, you know, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you know, Josephine Baker was a really, you know, acclaimed uh, dancer, performer in, in France who got nowhere here. And um, here we have, you know, Matisse's chapel in Nice um, and the people occupying the chapel are all family members who have passed away from Faith and Gold's family. Um, I believe, I mean, I, 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 I heard that one, so picked up on that piece. Okay, and again, we're back to dancing at the Louvre. And this is Faith and her, and her children dancing, dancing in the hallways, dancing in front of the Mona Lisa. There's a, there's a great deal of joy that's in these pieces, you know. Um, and again, Sonny's quilt. Um, and, and there's that, I've told this story, but I'll tell it again. Uh, you know, Sonny Rollins hit a point in the, in the early 60s where he was not satisfied with the sound that he was getting. And he went out onto the Manhattan Bridge and practiced every night out there until he got the sound that he wanted. And then he came back and, and played. And that, that, had a, that was a message about tenacity. And, and uh, I think he and Faith shared that. And the demanding quality of doing your art to the best of your ability to say what you had to say um, okay, and again, the jazz, the jazz stuff is, is very much a part. She's got, there are many more of these, of these images that I could have included, musicians, um, but you get the message. There's, there's a lot of work in this big show in, in New York, um, so... Definitely worth a trip. Okay. And one of the things that she that she saw was um, she she visited a um, an Asian museum in New York and saw some Tibetan tangas. And that, that actually was part of the inspiration for her moving over to quilts. Um, and you see, you know, the Martin Luther King piece. And again, um, we came to America. Uh, and you see, you see the, the, uh, the ship in the distance on fire and, and uh, not gonna say any more about this one. <sighs> okay. And Groovin High um, was a quilt, as you see down below uh, on, on the right. Um, she, did, she did two different versions of it, and both, both sold. And she also did a silk screen of, of the same composition. Um, this piece was installed in, in 2014 off the High Line. So it was on view there for, I guess it was a year. I think, that, I think they don't keep their things up for more than a year or two, um, but I, I missed it. I didn't see this one, I wish I had. That skyline, you gotta keep an eye on it. <laughs> okay. And she did a whole series 
of um, these these uh, mosaics that was part of the um, creative stations. I'm not sure what they 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 call the program that MTA is running, but um, she did 125th Street, and it's there. It's still there. So if you have a chance to get down there, it just looks fabulous. So all these all these you know great heroes. There's there's uh, Duke Ellington flying up there, and uh, next to him is um, oh god, uh, Bessie Smith. I think that's that image, and the the one. To all the way to the left, I think is Ella. Um, you know, so it's really it's really wonderful, and you see her standing in front of it. Somebody asked her uh, why she didn't put herself in there, and she said, oh, "I didn't think of it." <laughs> okay. And this is a series of younger artists, Jordan Castile, um, uh, Bisa Butler, um, and uh, Sonia Boyce. Sonia Boyce is, is British, um, but, but still very much acknowledges her, her indebtedness to Faith Ringgold. And Bisa Butler, these, this is a large scale piece. This is 50 by uh, 129. This is a section out of it. Actually, I did a detail so you can really see the fabric quality. Um, so, you know, and, and in the Jordan Castile, you see her integration of the patterns and the, the you know, the pop imagery and all of that. So these, these, young black women have picked up the, the gauntlet and, and are carrying it forward. You know, basically there's a certain kind of social consciousness that goes with this, that, that they seem pretty determined to carry forward. Uh, let me see how we're doing with time. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read you uh, something that kind of sums this up. It's written by Nancy Spector. So I, I really wanted to uh, read this. Um, During the late 60s and 70s, Faith Ringgold played an instrumental role in the organization of protests and actions against museums that neglected the work of women and people of color. Her paintings from this period are overtly political um, and present an angry, critical reappraisal of the American dream glimpsed through the filter of race and gender relations. Ringgold's more recent aesthetic strategy, however, is not one of political agitation or blatant visual provocation. Instead, she has come to embrace the potential for social change by undermining racial and gender stereotypes through impassioned and optimistic presentations of black female heroines. Ringgold's vehicle is the story quilt, a traditional American craft associated with women's communal work that also has roots in African culture. She originally collaborated on the quilt motif with her mother a dressmaker and fashion designer in Harlem. That Ringgold's great, great, great grandmother was a Southern slave who made quilts for plantation owners suggests a further and perhaps deeper connection between her art and her family history. One of Ringgold's early efforts dating from 1982 tells the tale of the stereotype Aunt Jemima through the painted image and sewn fabric and handwritten texts. The naive folk art quality of the quilts is part of Ringgold's scheme to emphasize the narrative over style, to convey information 
rather than a dazzling, rather than dazzle with elaborate technique. Tar Beach, the first quilt in Ringgold's colorful, lighthearted series entitled Women on the Bridge, depicts fantasies of a spirited heroine and narrator, Cassie Louise Lightfoot, who on a summer night in Harlem flies over the George Washington Bridge. Sleeping on Tar Beach was magical, explains Cassie in, in a text on the quilt. Only eight years old and in third grade, I can fly. That means I am free to go wherever I want to go for the rest of my life. Okay. Nancy Specker. Okay. Well, okay. So there's, there's um, a few things I wanted to say. There's the Outsider Art Fair is happening this weekend in New York City. Uh, tomorrow, ACA Gallery, which represents uh, Faith Ringgold, is opening a show of her prints along with this show at the, at the museum, at the new museum. Tomorrow at 2.30 to 4.30, Joan Lang is, is having a reception at the Chappaqua Library. And it's really the first exhibition that we've had in the gallery for over three years. Um, and the next artist that's up is Milton Avery. Uh, and I am going, since this is Women's History Month, I am going to include his relationship with Sally Avery, who is a wonderful painter and doesn't get the credit that she deserves. So I'm going to do both of them. But there's a Milton Avery show that's coming up to Hartford. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I have links over here. Uh, there's a great documentary on Faith Ringgold that was done by the BBC and it's Faith Ringgold tell it like it is if you if you google that you'll get to the Vimeo uh, there's uh, Faith Ringgold in conversation which is Tate Talks from uh, 2018 and there's a live virtual tour of the Faith Ringgold show that's happening this coming Wednesday um, at 4 p.m., um, it's it's online, and so you can you can register and go there. Um, there's also other programs there, and there's also faithringgold.com, and you go to the media page, and there's a bunch of YouTubes that that she'll connect you to that that are of Faith Ringgold talking about her own work. Um, I put up some of the books that she's that she's done. Tar Beach, of course. Um, great book. And I hope you all get to see this show. It's on through June 5th. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was wonderful. That was so different from some of your other lectures. I think everybody appreciated it. Thank you. Good. And so I hope you will all come to the library programs. See you in a soon for the Women's History Month programs and Larry's programs and the JS programs. So have a good weekend, everybody, and we will see you soon.